Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's special guest is a legendary musician, singer-songwriter, and producer who's brought us one of the longest string of non-stop hits in the history of pop and rock music. First as the lead singer and guitarist in the superstar group Tommy James and the Shondells, and then as a highly successful solo artist. He's had nine platinum albums, 32 Billboard Hot 100 hits, and 23 gold singles, including Crystal Blue Persuasion. Look over yonder. What do you see? The sun is rising. Most definitely. A new day is coming. Crimson and Clover. Moni Moni. I think we're alone now. Sweet cherry wine. He gave us sweet cherry wine. So very fine. We'll drink it right down, pass it all around. So stimulating, so intoxicating. Sweet cherry wine. Hanky panky. My baby does the hanky panky. Three times in love. But everybody's three times in love. Two times in love. Only one child in love. Everybody's three. And drag in the line. Making a living the old hard way. Taking and giving my day by day. I did snow and rain and a bright sunshine. Taking the line. His songs have been covered by everyone from Billy Idol, Tom Jones, Prince and Bruce Springsteen to Dolly Parton, Kelly Clarkson, and Cher. His music has been featured in 65 feature films, including Moneyball, Austin Powers, and Forrest Gump, as well as 53 TV shows, including Boston Legal, Criminal Minds, 
And who can ever forget the haunting sound of crystal blue persuasion in the season five finale of Breaking Bad? In 2010, he published his turbulent and eye-opening memoir entitled Me, The Mob, and The Music, One Hell of a Ride with Tommy James and the Shondells, which is listed as number 12 in Rolling Stone magazine's 25 greatest rock and roll memoirs of all time. In 2019, he celebrated his 50th year in the music business by releasing his highly anticipated album entitled Alive, with two tracks hitting the Billboard Adult Contemporary chart. And last year, he released a new compilation album entitled Rock Party. He sold well over 100 million records worldwide, and he's received five BMI Million Air Awards in recognition of his songs being played more than 22 million times on the air. He's received the Pittsburgh Legend Award and the Jukebox Artist of the Year Award, and he's been inducted into the New Jersey Hall of Fame and the Las Vegas Entertainers Hall of Fame. And he's attracted a whole new generation of music lovers with his own show every Sunday night on the Sirius XM Radio 60's Gold Channel. It's my great pleasure to welcome the incomparable Tommy James to our show. Tommy, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. It's great talking with you. Tommy, your musical talent became very apparent at an extremely young age. At four years old, your grandfather bought you a ukulele and you started piano lessons. At the age of 10, you got your first electric guitar and you started your first band, The Echoes, when you were only 12 years old, already playing in the Legion Hall in your hometown of Niles, Michigan. Did you always know you would have a music career? Well, I didn't know that I would, but there's nothing else I ever wanted to do. And that is the truth. Really, I've always had my ear in a, in a speaker of one kind or another. I began, as you said, the first group when I was 12. And uh, as soon as I saw Elvis on TV, I knew that's what I wanted to be when I grew up. And that really is a true story. <laughs> and I got my wish. Well, I want to tell you, I really loved your book because it's such an insightful expose, not only of your career, but of the music business. Your relationship with the notorious and infamous Morris Levy, owner of Roulette Records, was really fascinating and complex because you felt enormous loyalty and admiration for him, even though you knew he was incredibly corrupt and a bully, heavily involved with the mob, and he was ultimately convicted of extortion. Do you think Morris Levy was typical of the recording industry executives at that time? Well, I, I don't know if he was typical because he was really, roulette was really the, the center of gravity for a lot of those shenanigans. But the whole industry very definitely was, you know, especially on the small indie labels, it was pretty broad. I mean, they, they these street guys that invented the record business. It's kind of fascinating, really, when somebody should do a book on it. The, the first generation of record company owners were right off the streets. And, uh, you know, gradually it became corporate, uh, sort of like Las Vegas. But the first bunch of, of, of record company people were, were really, you know, right off the streets. And a lot of them were involved with the mob. So all I can say is that it's, it's quite remarkable what these guys built. They, they built this amazing machine called the record business. And, uh, you know, Morris Levy was one of the main builders of the industry. So from a historical standpoint, Morris was really a, an amazing character. Doing business with him was a whole other story. Uh, you know, so uh, we were walking on eggshells a lot because... While we were hanky-pankying and moany moaning and all the others, or there was this very dark and sinister story that was going on behind us that we really couldn't talk about. And this book was very cathartic in that way because it allowed me to tell the story that I've wanted to tell for a long time but was a little scared to. This was a long time in the making, and we were originally going to write a book called Crimson and Clover, and we were going to talk about the hits and writing songs and everything. It would have been interesting. But we got about a third of the way into it and realized that if we don't tell the roulette story, which really is the story, that we are cheating ourselves and everybody else, 
And so I was a little concerned because some of these guys were still walking around. And it's pretty bad when the only photos you can find of your record company execs were mug shots. That's, that's a bad sign. So, so basically, we put the project on a shelf for a couple of years until the rest of the roulette regulars, as I called them, passed on. And we felt like uh, it was safe to go ahead and finish the thing, which we did. And the minute we finished, we got sounded on for a movie and for the Broadway rights. And so the next couple of years are going to be really interesting. Anyway, well, that's the long-winded version. I want to give our viewers a sense of what you went through in dealing with Morris Levy. You wrote that if he paid you at all, he made you feel like he was doing you a favor. You said, and I'm quoting you here, Tommy, it wasn't a business relationship. It was psychological warfare. He knew when to throw me a bone, but there was never any doubt who was in control. Power and money were what his psyche and his soul were made of. He had to make you understand at a visceral level that he was prepared to blow everything to hell and destroy the very thing that was making him his millions unless you submitted. So, Tommy, looking back with the passage of time, why do you think you were so completely under his spell? Well, I don't know if it was a spell so much as, you know, under his thumb. Basically, I, I, ref, I always refer to my relationship with Morris as it was so complicated because on one hand, it was, all, it was like a, an abusive father-son relationship. You know, where the, you know, he beats the kid up, but he sends him to college, uh, you know, and on another, it was, I don't think I would have had nearly the success if we'd have gone with one of the big corporate labels as we had on roulette. As a matter of fact, when I first came to New York to sell the master, a hanky panky, my first record uh, exploded out of Pittsburgh. You know, it, it, it went number one in Pittsburgh and it was bootleg. It just came out of nowhere. So a week later, we're in New York selling the record to a major label. And we got a yes from Columbia. We got a yes from Atlantic, a yes from RCA. It was just amazing. We thought we were going to be with one of the big labels. So uh, I go to bed that night feeling really great. And about nine o'clock the next day, we start getting calls from all the record companies that had said yes the day before that Morris Levy, the head of the label, had called all the other labels and scared them to death. Uh, you know, said, this is my record, back off. So they did. And so uh, we were apparently going to be on roulette records. But if we had gone with one of the corporate labels, I can tell you right now that the competition would have been terrible. We would have been lucky to have been a one-hit wonder. And we would have, especially with a fluky record like Hanky Panky, we would have been turned over to an in-house A&R guy. And that's probably the last time anybody would have heard from us. At Roulette, they actually needed us. They hadn't had a hit in three years. And we, they rolled out the red carpet and gave us anything I wanted creative. So I was allowed to uh, put my own production team together to really learn my craft from the ground up, learn the record business at a street level. And that would have never happened at any other label. And I know we would have never sold uh, as many records at any other label. So all in all, I think it was a pretty good deal. You never went to see Morris before he died, and you wrote that you've always regretted it. What would you have said to him if you had gone to see him? Well, that's a great question, because in the movie, the very end of the story, the end of the film, I have this imaginary conversation with Morris. As a matter of fact, this new version of I Think We're Alone Now, that that we are very, very slow, very different from the original record, comes on the closing credits. And it's very poignant. And I, I, I would have probably said, thank you. I, I, the amazing thing is, you know, Doing business with more, getting paid from Morris Levy was an art form in itself. So crime doesn't pay, you know. But I, the truth is that we had tremendous success on Roulette Records that I, to this day, am amazed by. 
And I probably would have said thank you and let bygones be bygones. We got cheated out of many millions of dollars, but I would have probably just ended it right there. I, I would have loved to have talked to him. We, I, I didn't realize how sick he was. He had cancer. You know, he's convicted of uh, all kinds of things, you know, extortion and all kinds of things. And I always, well, I always had this very mixed feeling about him. And so what I'm saying is that he died of cancer before he could serve a day in prison. And I guess that was fitting, a fitting end to the story. And I wish I could have talked to him. I was going to go up the next day and talk to him, but I never got a chance. So it, it's a very human story. And I guess when you combine rock and roll with the mob, it's a it's a pretty amazing story. Oh, it certainly is. I, I think everybody's going to want to see that movie. Given what you went through as a young artist, Tommy, what advice would you have for anyone lucky and talented enough to get a recording contract today? Well, the business is so different today. The, uh, the certain elements are the same, like concerts. It's still the magic between the audience and the performer. But the delivery system today of music is so different and mostly in a good way. The, the, the audience is so much bigger today. The technology uh, to get music in front of people is is so great. But yet the one of the greatest challenges is to get new music in front of the fans because they have so many other things, videos, games. You know, music is not um, as much a part of kids' lives, I think, as it was in the 60s and 70s and even the 80s today. And I'm sorry to see that. Guitar sales, for example, are way down because kids aren't learning how to play guitar. They're playing synthesizer. So the, everything is changing. But, but the basics of, of rock and roll, that is the explosiveness of rock and roll, the magic between the fans and the, and the performers, that's all still there and, and greater than it's ever been before. So everything changes, but I think it's basically changed for the better that your basic question i would i would not go to record companies if i was young and starting out today knowing what i know today i would go to the publishing companies i would go to sony music or emi or uh, universal i'd go to the one of the big publishing companies because that's where the action is that's where the money is and the publishing companies if they like you and like your songs will then take you to a record company so it's a little different. It's tough with record companies today because they're not really signing anybody. So when I say the publishing companies, I'm, publishing companies are the owners of the songs. And if you go there, say, do take 10 of your songs and do demo them and take them to a publishing company, you have much better chance of getting in the door than you do a record company. You mentioned in your book how welcoming and friendly Peter Noon was when you first met him at one of your early concerts. When Peter appeared on our show, he talked about how important it was for him to be welcomed by the Beatles when they greeted his band, Herman's Hermits, backstage. Is it kind of a tradition in the music industry for the established bands to greet and welcome the newcomers? I think so. Of course, you're, you're competing with them because they're the upstarts, right? Uh, I remember uh, vividly uh, my first big arena concert back in 1966. And my first record, Hanky Panky, was just making it up the charts. And we played with uh, The Animals and Herman's Hermits, uh, two of my favorite acts and, you know, my heroes. I, when I got, I talked to Eric Burden and he was pretty nasty to be I said, oh yeah, he was, he was, hey, they were animals, right? So I went to, I went to Peter and uh, Peter couldn't be nicer and the whole group was great. And we got together after the show, uh, but that was my first recollection of being with the big acts is you got, you got to be careful. Everybody's different. 
Another important theme in your book, Tommy, is your relationship with drugs, which you used as a way of coping with the enormous stress you were under to constantly put out new music. You said that when you were in the recording studio, the control booth looked like a pharmacy. Now, I know that you've been clean and sober since 1986, but looking back, and I know this may be an inappropriate question, but do you think that in some way the drugs actually helped you creatively to be such a prolific writer? Well, I thought it did at the time, but that's so silly. No, of course not. They, they made me worse. But you, you certainly think so at the time that you're writing beautiful music. So all I can say was that the good Lord looked out for me uh, long enough to come to my senses. And I'm very, very thankful to him for that. I mean, and I really do mean that. And thank God. As I mentioned in my introduction, your songs have been covered by so many artists. In fact, in 1987, you actually had two of your songs go to number one. Tiffany's version of I Think We're Alone Now and Billy Idol's version of Moni Moni. Tommy, take us back to that first time that you heard one of your songs being sung by another big music star. Well, the first top 10, the first hit record done by another group was Sugar on Sunday. Uh, it's a song from our Crimson and Clover album, and it was done by The Click in 1960, late 68, it came out. And they went top 10 with it. And uh, this was a song that we were eventually going to do as a single, but their version actually was better than ours. Uh, that was the first time. And it was a real thrill to hear my music done by somebody else. I have, we've had over 300 cover versions of our songs done, you know, by everyone from Dolly Parton to Prince, uh, R.E.M., Billy Idol, the Boston Pops doing Moni Moni, you know, it's really hysterical. And I, I'm very flattered by it and very honored by it because uh, it's so interesting hearing other people's interpretation of your music. Uh, and, and you never get used to it. It's really a, a thrill no matter how it happens. Well, I think it's more than a thrill. It's just, it's such an honor. And I have to tell you, you know, when I was doing my research for this interview, one of the things about you that's very well known throughout the industry, and it comes through so clearly now, is how humble and how modest you are. I mean, here you are, a massively successful musician, singer, songwriter. I mean, you managed to outsell the Beatles in single record sales. And yet you mentioned several times in your book how amazed you were to be in the company of the big stars. Tommy, do you get, I mean, deep down inside, do you really get how incredibly talented and beloved you are? Well, look, that's awfully nice of you to say, and I appreciate it very much. But, you know, when, when you're living the story, uh, you realize how serendipitous everything is and how, uh, you know, um, amazingly, oh, I don't know, it, it, how, how the chances of this happening this way, if you zig instead of zag, your whole life can be different. And uh, I am so grateful to the people around me. I have had wonderful people around me. I mean, really talented and uh, people who have really helped me. I've been surrounded with love my whole life. I have been, uh, I've always felt like God was taking care of me because uh, he has been right from the start. And I've been so blessed and lucky in my life. It's just like one little miracle after another, the way I got into the business, the way I was able to stay in the business, the people who helped me. It was like every time I was walking across the river and I, I needed a stone to step on, it was just kind of magically there. So I'm so aware of how uh, blessed I am. And, and believe me, that is the truth. It, it's, it's being in the right place at the right time. And uh, you have no idea how, how grateful I am. Well, I think there's something else going on too. When I look at the longevity you've had in your career and the timelessness of your music, it's very clear to me that you've always had an innate sense or a knack 
for knowing what the next trend in music would be in order to stay relevant and current and popular. I'll give you an example. You knew very early on that in order to be taken seriously, you needed to get onto FM radio instead of just being on AM radio, which was considered uncool. And here's another example. You were one of the very first music stars to make a music video. In 1968, you made a video for Moni Moni 13 years before MTV was created. Where does that innate ability to understand music trends and to predict what the public wants, where does that come from? Well, before I'm anything else, I'm a fan. And so I approach it as an audience, as a, what, what is it that I want to see? What kind of music do I really dig? And I've been lucky because the, uh, when, I, when I approach it that way, I'm almost always right. Uh, you know, if I approach it uh, as, as a spectator, as a fan, rather than from the other side, uh, because I am a fan. And so when, when I do it that way, when I make records, when I, 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 it's, I always think, oh, you know, what are pe what's going to put people on the dance floor if I'm doing a dance record? What do people want to hear? What do, what do I want to hear in a record? What kind of harmonies, vocal harmonies do I want to hear? And so I approach it the way I would be listening to a record. And, and that's really the truth. I don't know how else to say it. It just is, you know, the, the things that turn me on usually turn other people on. No, I think that's very insightful. And it's, it's a tremendous gift that I hope you realize not everybody has. You've mentioned that your book is going to be made into a movie. What can you tell us about when we might get to see that? Well, Hollywood was shut down for about two and a half years because of COVID. And so we're, we were a little bit behind. But Barbara DeFina is producing the film, uh, Me, the Mob, and the Music. You know, she produced Goodfellas. She produced Casino. She produced several things with Martin Scorsese, Hugo, a few years ago, The Color of Money back in the 80s. I and mean, she's just had a string of great films. So we're very honored in, uh, that she's going to produce our film and Matthew Stone has done the screenplay and Kathleen Marshall is directing so it's really a, an all-star team and I'm watching all of it come together now I'm watching the the technical crew and you know it's it's really tricky getting all the technical people the technical team because these guys are all stars in their own right and getting them all together at the same time to make your movie. It's, it's, it's really amazing what a producer does. And we're probably looking at about another, well, they're casting right now. So we're probably looking at another 18 months to two years, honestly. I before. cannot wait. You know, when you look at the many famous people who've commented on your book, one of the people, Val Kilmer, described your life as charmed and tragic. Do you agree with that assessment? Well, you know, the tragedy has basically turned into, I mean, l loss has basically turned into a, a win because I get to tell the story. And, you know, so I, I lost probably 30 to $40 million to Sean Dells and I at Roulette because we didn't get paid, but we made money from concerts and from commercials and from radio airplay and, you know, all the other sources of revenue. And because I've been around so long, I basically got it back. I can't really say we've, we've lost in the big picture. We certainly haven't lost because you and I are talking today. And, <laughs> you know, the fans have been so good to me over the years. I can't really say it's been a loss. But, uh, you know, it's right for the story, the book that he read, uh, I'd have to say that Val was right on the money with that. Yeah, I get that. I see more charmed and more blessing than tragedy. Now, well, one, of so the really, one of the really funny things yeah. that I read, you managed once to smuggle a gun into a bucket of fried chicken onto an airplane 
I know you've had quite a passion for guns. Do you think that you wanted the guns for protection or for a sense of control? Just to be a smart ass. It, you know, I, you know I, I really never felt threatened or anything. I certainly never wanted to control people. No, I just wanted to see if I could do it. But this, you got to understand, this is back in the drug days. This is back in the days when my world was wiggling pretty good. Crimson and Clover, you know, started out as a real, started out as a real vocal. It ended up wiggling because that was my world at the time. I'm joking. But uh, yeah, you know, my uh, uh, my world was wiggling real good back then. And uh, I'm I'm certainly ashamed of what I did. You'd never do that today, would you? No. I want to tell our viewers that you can learn more about Tommy James, see his concert schedule, and buy his albums, live concert DVD, and other merchandise by going to his official website, TommyJames.com. And don't forget That's to correct. listen to his show, Getting Together with Tommy James, on the Sirius XM 60s Gold Channel, that's Channel 73, every Sunday from 5 to 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Well, Tommy, in our remaining moments, I want to pay tribute to your beautiful wife, Linda, whom we lost just about a year ago. She went with you to the Betty Ford Center back in October 1986, and she stood by you all those years. And I want you to know how very sorry all of your fans are for your tragic loss. Well, thank you so very much. That means a whole lot to me. It means more than you know. Linda was my center of gravity. She was my rock. We were married. We were together for 50 years. We were like the same person. You know, I'd start a sentence and she'd end it or the other way around. I miss her terribly. I can't tell you the 23rd of this month will be exactly one year. And uh, I'm so grateful to the people who have sent cards and letters and so forth. It really means a lot to me. You know, it, you got to remember, though, that this is a temporary separation. The Bible says that we are going to see our loved ones again. They're going to know us and we're going to know them. So this is just a temporary separation. And I can't tell you how much I loved her and uh, how much I miss her, but we will see each other again. Do you feel the love of your fans wanting I to do. convey that, that love and that support to you? I feel it every day, every day of my life. They truly have been with me throughout the ups and downs and everything else, and they've been there for me, and hopefully I've been there for them. You have been there for all of us. Have you thought about your legacy and how you would like to be remembered by the world? Well, not really, but I suppose who just approached music in a very blue collar way and very blessed. And, and, and I, I love these people who have put food on my table for almost 60 years now and who have uh, blessed me with the thrill of my life, being one of those rock and roll guys, like I saw on American Bandstand. And they, they gave me the ride and the thrill of my life, and I truly mean that. So I don't know how you put that into, into a little slogan, but uh, that's how I'd like to be remembered, as a very grateful individual. Well, I think the way you put that into a slogan is that you were the rock star that opened his heart to all of us. That's what I think it means. Thank you so much. That's good of you to say. It really is. So if you could go back to that nine-year-old little boy who was watching Elvis on the Ed Sullivan show, what would you say to him? Don't stop. <laughs> Don't stop. You know, when you picked up a guitar back then, it was considered an act of great rebellion. It was like picking up a rifle in some new army, and it was very rebellious. And it was sort of like driving a, a pickup truck with a bad muffler. You just, you know, it was it was looked down upon. So uh, I was very lucky to have parents that told me to keep going, that thought I was talented, and, and, and a mom who bought me all those guitars and gave me the desire of my heart because and I was so blessed to make it right out of high school. So... I would tell that little kid to keep on trucking. And thank God you did.
Well, Tommy, it's been such a pleasure having you on our show. I've loved every moment of our time together talking about your monumental career. I can't wait for the movie. Thank you for taking the time to chat with me. Thank you so much. It's been great talking with you. It really has. Our guest has been the legendary music superstar, Tommy James. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. My wonderful management team, Rick and Robin at the Marcelli Company in Hollywood, and my entire team at XPTV1 in the UK. Thank you all for watching. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.